What's up guys, welcome to Daily Dose of Reddit, this is your host, Zach, and today's subreddit is r slash tales from the customer. This story's called, Reservations Can Be Cancelled Without Notice, Very Long Till Dare the Bug. I just found this sub and had this story happen to me yesterday, so that's either a coincidence or someone upstairs wants you all to hear this story. That makes sense, my upstairs neighbors want me to hear everything, and I mean everything. Anyway, I am traveling with my family for the holidays and we land in a small tropical island off the coast of Africa at around 10 in the morning. On the flight and the bus afterwards, from the plane to the terminal, there were no gates, there was a group of about 10 rowdy people. They were singing, screaming across the plane to each other, not listening to the flight attendant's instructions to sit down when we were landing, etc. It was annoying, but whatever, they are on vacation too and just having fun. We get through a very lax customs and go to find our rental car. We had rented a Toyota RAV4 for $30 a day, a car that would do well in the low infrastructure area that we are. The employee takes us to the car and it's some model I have never even heard of. A Toyota IST maybe? This car looks very used, there are scratches and dents all over it. They try to say it's the same car because they are both Toyotas, classic bait and switch. We fight with them for a while, saying we want the RAV4 like the contract says, but they say the RAV4 cost $40 a day, and also this was the only car they had available. We decide to just take the car and negotiate down to $25 a day. We manage to cram most of our luggage into the trunk and get in. Then I start to suspect that this is someone's personal car that they loaned to the rental company. There are stickers, a business, Chelsea FC, and others all around the car, and inside are heavy fur zebra print covers, full pimp mobile style. We go to buckle in, and lo and behold, one of the seat belts doesn't have a corresponding spot to clip in. The rental car employee tells us to just use the spot to clip in the center buckle, but as anyone who has ever tried to do that before knows, it doesn't fit. We are just about ready to walk away and either rent a car from a different company or take the $100 taxi we were trying to avoid when in a last ditch effort my dad reaches underneath the seat cushion and was able to locate the clip in part and feed it up so we are off to the hotel. We drive about an hour and the roads are bad but not unbearable and we get to the town where our hotel is. We don't have a physical address, but it wouldn't really have helped anyways as there were no street signs or house numbers. We turn onto a road, and dirt road doesn't do it justice. This road has random rocks, hills, and divots making it nearly impassable. The car we had had incredibly low clearance before we loaded it with four people and all our luggage. I think the RAV4 would have had trouble on this road. Going through this road, we scraped the bottom of the car so many times I lost count. We got to where we thought the hotel was, but didn't see it. We stop and ask some employee of another hotel if they knew where it was, and they told us it was right around the corner. We drive around a little more to no avail, when my mom is led there on foot by a very nice local woman. It turns out that the same building we had seen the employees come out of was in fact our hotel, even though it had signage by another name. Here is where everything really starts getting stressful. I know, right? We try to check in, but are told that we don't have a reservation. The way we got this hotel was through a large American bank's reward program. The bank booked the hotel through one of the major travel sites for us, and everything was already paid for. We show the confirmation email and tracking number to the hotel employee. Important to note that we aren't actually in the hotel. We are standing outside and down the block in the middle of the street. The employee looks at the confirmation number and tells us that we don't have a reservation with them without even checking whatever system they use to see if our number matches. This sets alarm bells off in my head that we may be victims of another scam in the same day. But the booking was done through two reputable and familiar companies, so I honestly don't know what to think. 
The employee calls his boss, and we read out the confirmation number to him and are again told that we don't have a reservation to him and that the hotel is completely full. He also tells us that they haven't used the travel booking site that the bank used in a couple of years, basically meaning that the bank screwed up. The boss then tells us to go to see him in person at his other hotel about a mile away. We ask if we can go into the hotel lobby so that we can call the bank and figure out what is going on, but are denied. We had previously bought a SIM card, so we set up a hotspot and used it to call the bank on our way to the other hotel. We start the call off with the typical trying to speak with a real person that comes with a multinational corporation, then a call center employee somewhere in India just following a script. We explain the situation, and the employee offers to try and find us another nearby hotel and transfer our reservation. If you aren't reading this the day I posted it, you don't realize that yesterday was New Year's Eve, so every hotel is completely full. As this call is going on, we are driving to the other hotel to see the owner, manager, supervisor in person. The road to get to this hotel is a little bit better than the last one, but not much. So, some more scraping of the bottom of the car and a super bumpy ride. Again, no physical address and hard to locate, but we finally do. This is when we split up. I stay with mom who's on the phone with the bank, who are still trying to find a new hotel for us, and my brother and dad go into the other hotel. When they get out of the car, they see that the rear bumper of the car is dangling off. After using some elbow grease, I was able to pop it back into place, but I assumed that it wouldn't hold and we were going to get charged through the nose. Upon closer inspection, the car was in a previous accident that damaged the bumper. There were extra rivets holding it in place and the right side was a slightly different color, signifying that it had been repainted. Some time passes of more of the same, the bank trying and failing to find a hotel, when my dad and brother come back and tell us that there is one room at the hotel we were currently parked in front of. The owner was very nice and is gonna give us the room for the same price that we were paying at the other hotel. It's 4pm and this is our only option, so we decide to take it. At this point, we try to escalate the call to the bank get a supervisor, so that we can get a refund or some sort of compensation. The bank doesn't know we have found a hotel yet. We are put on hold thinking we are being transferred to a supervisor, but the same guy comes back and tells us he is going to check one more hotel. This happens three times and we realize that the phone with the hotspot only has a tiny bit of battery left. So through the power of going full Karen! We get to a supervisor, who also tries to book us a room multiple times. The supervisor then informs us that reservations are subject to change without notice. So at that point, it seemed like the bank was trying to cover its ass for leaving us stranded in a foreign country and was done dealing with us. We explain that we just want a refund and that the phone is about to run out of battery and that we'll figure out the night's lodging on our own. I don't remember exactly what was said, but it was some procedural nonsense that they needed to transfer us in order to process a refund. We told them again that the phone was about to die, so we would need to call them back later to issue a refund. Happy ending though. We got a room, even if it was very small for four people, and I am writing this while sitting on the beach. Luckily, the rest of our hotel reservations for the trip were made independently, although our flight home was also booked by the bank, but hopefully I won't have to make a part two. I'm sure I left some stuff out, but this got super long and I apologize for that. Sorry if this isn't as crazy or interesting as some of the other stories on this sub, but this was recent and I just needed to tell this story somewhere. Oh my gosh, the freaking audacity of that freaking bank, man. That would be terrifying freaking going to a country with the assumption that your bank did its job and finding out that you might not have anywhere to freaking stay. Oh my goodness. Oh my gosh. All right, this story's called, I get a free item because of a male Karen. Disclaimer, first time posting it on mobile. Characters. Lucy, my friend I was visiting for the day. Ezra, me, that's a cool name. Ken. I'm not sure what the male equivalent of a Karen is, so we'll go with this. Ken is a good one. 
Molly, the cashier. Margaret, the supervisor and cashier. I drove a few hours to hang out with my friend Lucy in cosplay for the day. We went to a few thrift stores, one of which was where this story takes place. Lucy found a remarkable ball gown for an original character. And while waiting for someone to help her get it from the mannequin, I went in search of my own useful find. I found two fur-like fabrics that will be perfect for a Viking cosplay still deciding what to do with it. We met up at the front to wait in line with the appropriate six feet apart as per current rules. Whilst in line, Margaret mentioned how much her daughter loves Urza and Lucy and goes to the local conventions. Oh, this is fairy tale! We talked about how much we love the conventions, and that's actually where we met and became friends. Margaret arranged jewelry behind the counter so she could continue to talk to us while we waited. The people in front of us finally left after paying for their large amount of secondhand goods. Before Lucy and I could step up, Ken sashayed forward to the cashier. Okay, so I don't have a car, but I would like to make a donation. No problem, sir. You can take your donations around back near the garage door and we'll bring them in afterwards. No, like that's not going to work. Like, I don't have a vehicle and there's no way I'm carrying all of it that far. No way. Okay, well, when you have the items to drop off, you can bring them Monday through Saturday, 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. and we'll process them for you. Ken waving his hand dismissively. Fine, just forget it. Can I make a monetary donation then? If you're not gonna take my stuff, that'll have to do. You'll need to go to our main office for monetary donations because we can't take them here unless our manager is here. But I'm already here. Ah, fine. When is your manager going to be here? Margaret realized the line hasn't moved and looks over and asks Molly what's going on. Molly started to explain about the donation and double check their manager's schedule. Ken folds his hands together and pointed them at Margaret. Listen, I want to be heard. This nice lady is helping me. You need to stop talking. I looked at Lucy and gave her the look like, is this really happening? You are being heard. We need to get this line moving. Our manager will be here on Monday. She can help you then. Or you can go down to the main office. Half a dozen more people had joined the line behind Lucy and myself with various amounts of goods. Are you a manager? Cause you look and sound like a manager. I'm wanting to make a donation, but apparently I can't today. I need you to take my donation. No sir, I'm not a manager. I'm just the shift supervisor. At this point, I about lost it with his attitude and mannerisms. We had been waiting several minutes due to him cutting line. I whispered to Lucy, I don't remember what a male Karen is called. Do you? Lucy stifled a chuckle. <laughs> no, but I wonder if he identifies as a Karen. We started laughing as quietly as we could manage, but every time he said manager or acted uppity, we would start giggling again. Ken glared at Margaret, then gave Lucy and I a confused look before turning to Molly. Thank you for being nice. Now, who is your manager so I can give the donation? I'd rather not come back later. Molly tells him again about their manager not coming in till Monday, and only she could do anything because it was a different safe. Because he wasn't stopping and the line was growing, Margaret gestured for me to give her my items and she would open up another register. Ken to Molly, Thank you for being a nice cashier. You should be the one in charge. He raises his voice and angles his head towards Margaret, instead of other rude people. That's sweet of you, but she knows a lot more about this stuff than I do. But here's a brochure with her email and a phone number for the home office. Well, I'll see you soon when I talk to the manager. He swaggers to the exit with his nose in the air. Molly wipes the counter for several minutes. As he was leaving, Lucy and I were talking to Margaret in hushed tones trying to cheer her up. I've worked retail. Customers like that are very frustrating. Margaret nods, looking through my fabric. Yep, and nothing you say or do will ever be good enough. We can only hold a limited number of people in the store, so him holding up the line was completely uncalled for. I'm a dispatcher, and right now, this whole thing has brought out a lot of entitlement. Thank you for your service. It'll be four dollars. Thank you, ma'am, but there are two of them. I didn't see a second tag, so it's four dollars. She gave me a look, indicating she knew. Understood, ma'am. I hand her the money. 
I hope I'll get to see you and your daughter at the next convention. Margaret nodded and started taking care of Lucy. She even gave Lucy the pair of gloves that was on the mannequin she originally said was separate. Molly asked for the next customer. Edit. Lucy and I were cosplaying from Fairy Tale. She was wearing casual cosplay for Lucy. I was wearing Ezra's clear heart clothing but replaced the wraps on the chest with a white tank top. That is badass. But anyway, um, it's nice to see uh, a Karen or a Ken, if you will, uh, be so passionate about donations and charity that they are willing to act entitled about everything in their life. This story's called Mandatory Masks. Sorry if this makes me a Karen, but I was pissed. I just came from the convenience store gas station down the street. They have a sign posted on the door saying masks are mandatory. A city ordinance, I think. No big deal. Too bad the cashier had his pulled down under his chin. I asked him to put it in place before I got too near the counter. He told me he would when he was done helping me. I said he could help me after he pulled it up. He said he wears it mostly, but sometimes he has to breathe. Asthmatic here, I get that it's tough sometimes, but move to the back away from people to take it off for a breather. I said, if it's mandatory for me to have it on, it's mandatory for him. Told him to put my stuff back and I'd go elsewhere. He thanked me. <laughs> you know what? As long as they weren't really rude to the person, um, I feel like they acted responsibly. In my opinion, I wouldn't say it's right or wrong. I wouldn't tell on anyone really, be it management or police. Unless they're doing something that's hurting or affecting other people in a negative way. Because then it's not only their problem, you get what I mean? Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that bell to never miss an episode.